Hello, we have Dr. Mark Golston with us today. Dr. Mark Golston is one of America's prominent psychiatrists and consultants to major organizations. His book, Just Listen, ranked number one in six Amazon Kindle categories and has been translated into 14 languages. Dr. Golston, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, and I've been looking forward to this. Thank you. Dr. Golston, uh, I teach a uh, course in leadership in project management, and my students like to know how can they reach out to others. And, and this is kind of the title of your book, Just Listen, Discover the Secrets to Getting Through to Absolutely Anyone. What are some of your words of wisdom to, to the students? Well, I'm going to give you, uh, I continue on my journey, uh, life is a lifelong learning process, and uh, something that, I, that uh, is an extension of the book that I hope your uh, listeners and viewers will find interesting, um, I have a program in which I, which I basically say resistance doesn't exist. Resistance doesn't exist, and so let me see if I can convince you of that and your viewers. Uh, I think what exists, and, and there's a method to my madness, um, and since I'm a psychiatrist, I can medicate myself if my madness <laughs> kicks in too much. Um, I think what exists mostly in the world is what I call non-rational, non-functional self-preservation. Non-rational, non-functional self-preservation. And by that, what I mean is that often what you experience as resistance is a combination of their, a person protecting themselves from your pushiness, your persuasiveness, from your agenda, and also wanting to preserve their identity. So self-preservation involves one's identity mm. and one's self-defense when someone is trying to impinge on that identity. Mm. So for instance, it's, it's an, this is an American metaphor, so I apologize for that. But the identity of a U.S. Marine, when they're trained, is we find hostile forces, we go in there, and we kill the enemy. We kill, we kill hostile forces, and they're, and they're very proud. So uh, Marines uh, are different than the other armed forces in the United States, and they say, once you're a Marine, you're a Marine for life. And there's tremendous pride, but when that Marine tries to transition to civilian life, and they've seen their buddies killed, when someone is whining and complaining in the cubicle next to them about a, a, a someone scraped their car, it tends to make them a little bit nuts mm -hmm. because they can't relate to that. And so uh, the purpose of this is if you can look at people not as resisting you, but they're engaged in this self-identity and any, uh, any defense against anything trying to pull them away from that. Uh, and why it is non-rational is because often that self-identity, uh, being a Marine, uh, does does not really have a place when you come home, in civilian life. Mm. It, it it just doesn't fit there. So it, it's it's non-rational to be a Marine elsewhere, and it's non-functional because it doesn't work. It goes against the culture. Uh, it triggers reactions to you. And so if you can imagine, though, that when you're looking at people, the next time you look at people, uh, if instead of seeing them as resistant, see them as trying to preserve their sense of identity and to protect the, themselves from anyone trying to push them. And the reason for that is that when you find yourself getting frustrated or escalating, uh, and, and often the more you get frustrated yourself, the more you perceive them as resistant, but really what they're perceiving you as is that your frustration, you're trying to overpower them. And so at the moment that you can sort of become aware that you're getting frustrated, and in my book what I talk about, and just listen, what I talk about is our three brains, and we have a human reasoning brain which is 250,000 uh, years old, and we have a middle mammalian emotional brain, and that's 65 million years old, and we have a lower reptilian fight or flight actional brain, and that's uh, that's uh, I think 225 million, give or take, a week or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and in the middle of our mammalian brain, we have something called an amygdala, mm -hmm. and the amygdala is kind of the emotional sentinel, 
And when it gets overloaded, it hijacks us away from being able to assess the situation on its own merits. And we call that an amygdala hijack. And so when you are trying to persuade someone and they are there feeling under, uh, under assault, it runs the risk of your triggering an amygdala hijack in them. And by the way, if they haven't been listening to you and cooperating with you, uh, you've actually had the hijack first. <laughs> and, so, and so what's happening is uh, what, you, what you perceive as resistance, they perceive as you being pushy. Mm. So what, you, uh, what would be a good thing to do is to identify any of the people uh, that you have problematic communication with. Uh, in fact, I would take out a piece of paper, put a line down the middle, and on the left side, write down all the people that you have very good communication with. And what that would mean is that when you're, when you're speaking to each other, you're either speaking to each other or even with each other. And on the right side of that vertical line, put down the people that you have poor communication with, and those are often people that you have poor relationships with. And those are people uh, who feel you're talking at them or over them, and you feel they're pushing back and resisting you. And this, is, this would be a good thing because when you uh, are going to work with people on the right side of that page, uh, often when, when you get triggered and then you trigger them, and you have two amygdalas hijacking uh, each of you, there's not going to be cooperation or collaboration. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. You're just in so, a heightened state of emotional kind of turmoil right, pretty much. Yeah. Right. So identify those people uh, so that you know that when you go in there, there is a likelihood, without it being your intention, that things could escalate. Mm. Uh, their voice or your voice can get pitchy, it can get high, it can get uh, uh, anxious, it can get angry. So be mindful of that, and then when you're with them, be mindful when it's starting to happen. And here's a suggested tactic. Uh, see, what is happening right then is, what's clear is that the two of you are, th uh, are seeing the situation differently. And, uh, and there's something that I suggest to people when they're escalating, uh, say to yourself, downshift. And what that means is when you're driving a stick shift car and you downshift, you pull the road into you. You create more traction. So even though your, your uh, RPMs are going up in the car, you're actually gaining more control of the road. So when you find yourself escalating, say to yourself, downshift. That's a signal. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, what you, what you then say is, it's clear that we see this very differently. And then uh, there's something I talk about in the book, and maybe we'll get into that, which is mirror neurons. And mirror neurons means that we tend to often imitate what we see, and they imitate what we see. So if we're becoming defensive, they're going to become defensive. But if we can bear our neck and show genuine, earnest humility, they're more likely to open up. Mm. So if you get to this point, and, uh, and Instead of escalating, you say, it's clear that we think differently and we see things differently. And here's where you share, you bare your neck and it's very disarming. You could say, and what's also clear to me is how little I understand how you have come to think the way you do about this project. And so they're, they're going to find that they're not going to know what to do with it because it, that doesn't call for defensiveness. Mm. And so they're going to start to let go of their defensiveness and then you go even deeper and you look at them and you, and you show some humbleness and you could say, what's also clear to me is how I have not wanted to understand the way you think about this. And I'm going to fix that now. Mm. So uh, if, if you will give me the opportunity to explain how you see this project or you see your contribution uh, or how things fit together, I will do my utmost to listen and keep listening until I understand how you came to think that way. So that is incredibly respectful. You're validating the value of their thinking. Uh, and you're also 
you're, you're, you're being humble and you're being vulnerable, but you're doing it in a very, uh, in a very strong way. Uh, something that I've noticed in the best leaders, and tell me if you think this uh, goes along with your instincts, is I think the best leaders are people who can take charge without being controlling or judgmental. So it's taking control without being controlling. I definitely agree with that. Um, and like, it's, I feel like, although it goes against people's intuition that, oh yeah, I, if I want something to happen, I have to control, I have to try to make it happen. It, science shows, and there's been so much research on motivational psychology and so on, the more controlling you are, the less effective it is. And the more autonomy you give people, the more, uh, they're willing to cooperate and collaborate. Um, well, well, that, maybe that gets into something that uh, one of the things that people seem to find most interesting about Just Listen is I talk about uh, this part of the uh, our neurology called our mirror neuron. So let me spend a few minutes on that because people find that kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late 1980s, I think in Italy, a group discovered a, an area of neurons in macaque monkeys, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and at first they called them monkey see, monkey do neurons, mm -hmm. and, uh, and these neurons seem to be involved with monkeys imitating each other. And it's very interesting because there's both a sensory component, you know, you notice something and then you imitate it, that's a motor component, so it's a very interesting uh, uh, kind of area. Mm -hmm. And then they've discovered this, that it also exists in human beings, and fMRI studies have verified this. And so they believe that mirroring is involved in imitation, learning, and empathy. Uh, uh, also imitation, when someone yawns, you'll yawn. Uh, when someone, I can even just say this, when someone slices their finger with a piece of uh, paper, just even that image, you can wince, you can imagine it, mm. and, and that empathy is, uh, seems to be uh, involved in the mirror neuron network. What's also fascinating is there's research that's showing that when the mirror neuron uh, network is defective, that contributes to autism. And so autistic people are not able to tune into social uh, cues. And so they're not able to mirror things. And something that I've discovered, uh, a, a, and a name that I've discovered, and it's, it's purely based on 30 plus years of experience, and it's intuitively correct, uh, even though neurologists would probably take me to task, but I, I'm a practitioner, I'm not a researcher, I'm a hostage negotiator. Um, uh, I, uh, I've coined the term mirror neuron receptor deficit, which I've now shortened to mirror neuron gap. And what that means, is if you perceive that you are conforming to the outside world and to other people's psychological and emotional needs, it creates a hunger for the world to mirror you. Mm. And, uh, and if you see yourself uh, always serving others and caring about others and, and feeling that it's not returned, it widens the gap. Uh, one of my good friends is the top executive coach in the world, uh, Marshall Goldsmith. And a lot of what he talks about in helping people to succeed beyond their technical competence, because what he says is your technical, what, what he says, his, his best-selling book was What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And it means that you can get so far with technical competence, but after that you need to be effective with people. Mm. You can't do everything on your own. And he talks about various things that tend to frustrate other people. So having to have the last word, never taking no for an answer, uh, uh, yes budding, what people say, that triggers, to me, that widens the mirror neuron gap. Uh, also, uh, and so my view is when you can accurately mirror the other person, it lessens the mirror neuron gap, and they're more likely to feel uh, uh, grateful to you, lower their guard, and want to cooperate with you. And so that, uh, that suggested scenario I said at the, uh, some minutes ago about 
uh, taking charge and taking control of the miscommunication and just in a calm way saying what's clear is we see this and, and think about this differently and what the other person is thinking is yes you see it differently from me you don't care about how I see it you have to have your way you're really very pushy and disrespectful that's what they're thinking and so when you say to them what's also clear is I don't understand how you think and then when you add and what's really clear is I haven't wanted to understand how you think and I'm going to fix that uh, what you're doing is mirroring what they may be feeling and there's a good chance they will lean into that. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. So, yeah. so if uh, so, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's it's really going counterintuitive to what we think. Is like we're trying to push, but it's really actually just stepping back and just. I guess it comes from a compassionate uh, place of wanting to really care for that person and understand that person and. Because of that, that person just lowers their guard and becomes open to you and receptive to what you're saying. Is that is that kind of right? And I'll give you an and I'll, and and rather than tell you, I'm going to show. I'm going to do this with. Uh, and you, and I pronounce your name, Esan. Correct. Yes. So, so, uh, so what I'm hearing you say, and when you looked up just now to break eye contact, you were. It seemed to me that you might have been trying to figure out. Okay. Uh, this is a course on leadership. This is a course on getting things done. It would seem that the way to get things done is to push, but somewhere inside me, I understand what you're saying, Dr. Goulston, and I understand that when you push, it really doesn't work, but I need, uh, and I'm hoping you'll be able to provide links to the people listening who may not get this, who may think, uh, especially as engineers, well, you know, the, you know, we're very linear, and so you were looking up because you were being empathic to your viewers and you were understanding what I was saying and you were valuing what I was saying but you wanted to create the associational link of what I was saying to your viewers so that they find this valuable as opposed to finding it confusing. Is any of that accurate? <laughs> it's exactly right. <laughs> it's just and, it's, and, and what's interesting, it's interesting that, and, and this, this is perfect, and the reason you laughed with some embarrassment is that you felt understood uh, without having to tell me much and there was something delightful about that because what happened is I spontaneously closed the mirror neuron gap between us. Something else I talk about is uh, how when you go to a movie uh, and, and the movies that make you cry, when you see scenes that make you cry, not so much out of sadness, but because two characters have been in conflict for the entire movie. And then at some point in the movie, uh, and often people on YouTube will go back to that scene because they want to experience it. And what happens is when you see people who didn't understand each other, didn't want to understand each other, suddenly understand each other, what happens is we cry when we see that. And the reason we cry is because we vicariously have lived through the characters and felt that gap and then suddenly when they understand each other the relief that they feel and we feel that the gap has been closed uh, over, uh, overtakes us and in the privacy of looking at the screen and no one can see us cry we all cry that's absolutely and, right you know, and, and so uh, I'm going to need your help because I can see that you're on board, uh, but how do we make this valuable to the people listening to this so it doesn't seem like gobbledygook? That's the hardest part. <laughs> we are dealing with engineers after all. I mean, I, I have an engineering background myself. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my PhD is in, in telecommunications engineering. Now, the reason I am talking to you now is I see the importance of what we're talking about and getting that across to, to our technical professions. So. Um, you know, the well, I, have, I, I have a good way to do it. So I'm going to uh, So I'm I'm now increasing your gap because I interrupted you. Sorry. Uh, now this is for any engineers who are in a relationship, a uh, uh, a marriage, a couple, and sometimes the communication isn't that good mm. because you want to convert the communication into a problem to be solved, and the other person does not want a solution. They want to feel. A worthy of your understanding they don't want to be figured out and if you're an engineer you're very you're much better at figuring out than understanding this emotional stuff mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to give uh, some tips to people. I don't know if it'll help you in project management, but it'll prevent you from getting divorced. So <laughs> mind I give that to you? Uh, yeah, please, please. <laughs> Please, please, I need a, I don't even know your personal life. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not I, married I yet, but at some stage uh, I may be. So okay, okay, I want to no, know how to retain okay, that marriage. Well, uh, and, and it's interesting because uh, uh, when I speak to entrepreneurs who are very good, uh, they're, they're very um, uh, momentum driven and they're great problem solvers. And one of the epidemics for entrepreneurs is uh, they kind of fall in love with their wife-to-be mm. and so that's kind of exciting mm. but what they really love is their is their business and then uh, uh, and then they have children and what happens is they become devoted to their business and their children and they look at their wife or their spouse as a nag right. and it frustrates them greatly mm -hmm. and so uh, I've been speaking to a number of CEOs and we we often uh, entrepreneurial CEOs, and I would say 50% of the time the conversation shifts to, can I talk to you about my girlfriend? Can I talk to you about my, uh, now I don't want to be sexist because th there are some uh, uh, women who are the much more practical, pragmatic, and the, and, and the men are very emotional. So I, I, this is not, uh, I, I'm trying not to be sexist, but in, but in general, uh, you know, it seems that more, uh, it's more of a male thing to want to solve things and figure things out. Mm -hmm. So. Here's a way to understand things that will change your future uh, in relationships. Men who are good problem solvers, when they feel there's a rift between them and the other person, they hold back until they can make sense of it. So they don't want to step into that gap until it makes sense to them. Now to the other person, they don't want to step into that gap until it feels right. And so there you are trying to make sense of this, and they and the person who is more comes from a feeling type feels that you're cold and robotic, and 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 clueless. And you and from your point of view, you're trying to help make things better, and they're getting more aggravated because it feels wrong. It feels like you're talking down to them. It feels like you're trying to control them. Now we get back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, they feel that you're attacking them or trying to control them, but you are engaged in non-rational, non-functional self-preservation because it feels that if their emotions overwhelm you, you will both drown. But they don't see you as trying to protect yourself. They see you as trying to control them. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and so I'll, I'll just finish this because if we can save future relationships, uh, that would be a, a nice benefit from this call. Uh, if you're more the sort of the solution oriented person and you could be male, you could be female, uh, often if you're a solution oriented person you tend to think before you speak and the reason for that especially from a male perspective is if you don't think before you speak and you say the wrong thing at a primitive level you believe another man will pull out a gun and shoot you. It's very primitive. Whereas women often don't believe if they say the wrong thing, someone's going to shoot them. And my wife and I have gotten into some tiffs because someone will cut us off and she'll honk the horn and say something and, and he'll stop and I'll say, great, uh, uh, you just started a fight, I'm going to have to calm the thing down and he's going to shoot both of us. <laughs> and, but the thing to understand about the other person, uh, frequently a woman, but again it could be the, more, the emotional person, could be a man is they, they often need to speak first in order to get clear. So they need to speak first to get something off their chest and after they get something off their chest they can then become clear. And if they don't have a fear that speaking first is going to get them hurt or in trouble, they will do that. And so uh, if you can see it that way and actually, if you're dealing with, uh, this gets back into the workplace, if you're dealing with someone who gets highly emotional, you know, the more you try to shush them, the more you try to control them, the more they feel you're talking down to them, the more they feel a sense of humiliation. If instead, what you can imagine is, uh, and I'm a medical doctor, so this is going to be rather disgusting, if you can imagine that when they're getting that way, if you can look them in the eye, not in an intimidating way, 
And imagine that you're looking into an abscess that you need to drain. You know, when we have an abscess in our body, you can't suture it. You have to put a drain in it, let it air out, and let it heal from the inside out. And so when you're dealing with someone like this, and this gets back to my hostage negotiation training, is when they're escalating that, if you can look them in the eye, and you've got to practice this because they may say, what are you looking at? So you've got to cultivate a comfort that you're really looking into a fear, pain, non-rational, non-functional, whatever. And, uh, and, and if you can lean into whatever they're saying, imagine you're staring into an abscess and also you're looking for the eye of the hurricane. And if you look for the eye of the hurricane, you can get centered, uh, be very calm, and, wh and whenever they say whatever they say, uh, what you can say is, uh, 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 and they're saying, what are, what are you looking at? Uh, what you say is, I'd like to know what's really going on, because I have an idea that what's really going on is not what we're talking about, and I think if I could know what's really going on and we could somehow address that, I don't know, I can't guarantee it, but I think this conversation is going to go differently. Uh, and it's not that easy for me. And again, when you bare your neck, they'll bear theirs. You could say it's not that easy for me because I, I can think of many times in the past when I got to this point in a conversation, or a conversation with you, you know, I would start getting frustrated, I would start screaming, I, w I, I would walk away, and I don't want to do that now. I don't want to make this worse. So I'm trying to understand as best I can what's really going on. And there is always something going on. And usually, unless you're dealing with just a mean-spirited, evil person, underneath what's usually going on is uh, uh, either fear or hurt. Uh, and a good friend of mine uh, who you should interview, his name is Chris Littlefield, and he has a uh, uh, and I actually interviewed him uh, at the Harvard Business Review. So if you, in my blog, if you look up Goulston and uh, Chris Littlefield, he works in uh, Beirut, Lebanon. And what he's discovered in his research is one of the things that most upsets people is that the person feel, doesn't feel that someone has acknowledged their value. And, uh, and so what he does in his work to bring uh, warring factions together in that part of the world is he will, he, he will often suggest when the other person is escalating, stay centered, and then again, using humility, saying, what have I failed to appreciate that's really important to you about this whole thing? And when you say that, it's totally disarming. They're going to say, what? Yeah, um, you know, I was about to react, but what I realized is I think I have failed to acknowledge and appreciate something and recognize something, and what might that be? And he actually told the story of someone who was playing mediator, medi uh, uh, even though she belonged to one side, she was playing mediator, mm. and her side of a conflict saw her as a turncoat. They saw her as disloyal. Whereas her role was to be neutral, mm. and her side kind of isolated, treat her, treat her poorly. Mm. And then what happened afterwards is that, you know, after the, uh, uh, the mediation finished, uh, Chris brought this up uh, and, uh, and had people ask her, well, what did we, f you know, uh, you were disloyal to us, and, uh, and what did we fail to appreciate? And she said, do you know how hard it was to be neutral? You know, and if I wasn't neutral, it wouldn't have been productive at all. And the fact that you thought I was your enemy, and you talked down to me, and I had to be neutral? You have no idea how much that hurt me. And she just started crying. And what happened is it changed everything. So I don't know what people can take from this, and again, engineers, this may not compute. I, I, I hope we'll get something from it from these stories, but they're very powerful, I believe. Mm. I think what we engineers and technical people and project managers, including, uh, fail to do is is actually what what you've mentioned in in uh, in layman terms. Listen, I think it's really listen to why people are 
behaving the way they're behaving or doing the doing things the way they're doing instead of because what we generally do we try to make sense of things in our own heads and we live in our own heads try to make sense of things without really um, asking questions and and really caring about what the other person's values are and what the other person thinks and how they think so I hope like you know the takeaway from our interview is is that to bring more focus on uh, really hearing people and understanding why what is what is it looking down into what the real issue is rather than just making assumptions am I yeah, kind of on the right track there? Uh, no, you're totally on the right track um, there's a little exercise I do which is it's called how to make an engineer feel mm -hmm. I try it on you? sure <laughs> So if I'm on the other person. side and you're frustrating me mm -hmm. and, and you think you're being helpful, you're just trying to solve the problem uh, and you don't know why I'm getting so upset. Uh, if I were to say to you, Esan, I'd like you to imagine someone uh, uh, in your career, in your department, where you work, who no matter what you say seems to steamroll over you with what they believe and anything you say is not just regarded as different it's regarded as wrong and stupid in your in your life can you remember anyone who approached you that way and you really couldn't get a word in edgewise my father <laughs> okay and so no, this is very good, and uh, uh, and uh, I think it uh, you're going to you scored points with me. I, I I hope the listeners. So in a sense, and so what I would say to you is, Esan, knowing what that was like to not be heard and steamrolled, and be maybe disregarded or minimalized, and knowing how much that hurt you and frustrated you, and still does, and that's why you laugh slightly uncomfortably. Uh, knowing what that's like to steamroll and not listen to someone, would you want to make anyone else feel that way? No. And so that's what I call the power of analogy. So when you can't get someone to understand how you feel, have them think of a situation in which someone has done to them what you feel they're doing to you. And it's interesting, uh, I don't know if you, you know, I picked it up, but I'm not an engineer, uh, and I can feel it when you said no, you became softer. You became less, let's drive the agenda of this interview. You, you took a break and you thought, God, I wouldn't want to cause anyone that pain. And, and, and so I think that's, that's where you have the possibility of kind of a revelation. And um, and I had a similar father, and uh, I have three children, and I've kind of spared the rod, spoiled the child, but they're, they're doing well. And uh, and my commitment is that my children would never be afraid of me, because my brothers and I were a bit afraid of my father, and they, he's passed away, and he was he was actually a good person. He was just a fearful person. You know, I, I think his difficulty came from fear, not from being a bad person. Mm -hmm. And I've gone the other way. And so uh, the last thing I would ever want my children to do is be afraid of me. And so sometimes it's easy, so it's easy for them sometimes to walk over me. But, you know, they've turned out pretty well. Uh, but you can understand where I'm coming from, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. And, and I think uh, for myself... Um, I think the, the way I felt at times when I communicated with my father just made me realize the importance of really understanding others and and seeing where they where they're coming from and 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 as much as sometimes we get uh, obsessed with our point of view it's always always important to kind of come to a point and say hey look the way they see things the way that person sees things is because they've gone through certain experiences, their upbringing, their way, their uh, their genetic makeup, or whatever whatever it is. But kind of really try to 
uh, you know, step in their shoes and try to see things from their perspective. I think that really helps me a lot of times. Is uh, I almost like sometimes think of if I just look at that person's brain and how it's wired up, I would really understand, if, you know, how why they do things the way they are or, or they behave the way they are. Um, so, so, so here's here's a simple tactical thing. You don't even have to understand how it works, uh, but it works. So the three-step thing to being able to break through one of these impasses uh, is uh, recognize that you're reacting. So the first step is you say to yourself, uh, that's how you're reacting. You know, you just say it in your head. The next step is downshift. So it's kind of like, you know, try to shift away from reacting. And then the third step is get curious. Mm. And the reason for that is you cannot be earnestly curious about another person and be uh, angry at them at the same time because anger is a motoric thing. It's at the other person. Curious is a sensory thing. And so, uh, uh, and we, we can go back to relationships because uh, one of the advice that I give people in, in relationships, uh, girlfriends and boyfriends, is when you find yourself escalating, you know, do say to yourself, you're reacting, downshift, and the, and, and the curious thing, you say to yourself, what's it like for the other person right now? You may not even know, and I remember with my wife, and we've been very happily married for 35 years, but I remember some years ago, we were escalating, and I was able to, uh, happily and luckily on one occasion, you know, not escalate. And I paused and instead of making things get worse, I, I said to myself, what's it like for her right now? And instead of thinking, oh, she needs to be right, I, I paused and I said, what's it like for her? And I really didn't know. Uh, and what I said to her is, do you like where this is going right now? Because I don't. And she paused and she said, no, I can't stand it when it goes like this. I said, yeah, me too. And then I said, do you have any, any way how we can stop it from going there? And then she immediately smiled and she said, I don't know, but you're doing real good. <laughs> <laughs> so just that awareness was enough to kind of break that tension. Is that right? Like just stepping back and just looking at the situation. Uh, right, and, and, what, and, and as we go back to the original thing that I mentioned, what gets in the way of awareness when, when you are locked in a state of non-rational, non-functional self-preservation yourself, that goes against awareness. And, uh, and, and uh, this is actually a skill or a tool that you can develop. It's, it's, very, it's not easy but it's pretty simple, and uh, and I think if you actually try it out, uh, you will see amazing results. I mean, you'll see the uh, uh, the other person instead of being your enemy, if you're if you're bearing your neck to them, uh, it doesn't show weakness; it actually shows strength. Mm. And and going back to what uh, um, your point here, like this week we're actually looking at emotional intelligence. So uh, you actually covered a lot of that in, in terms of self-awareness and self-management. It's um, now that what you mentioned is the first step is is self-awareness is becoming aware that I'm reacting to this situation. Mm -hmm. So then you can step back and then uh, obviously it's uh, you know preventing your amygdala from being charged up and taking control. Um, so self-awareness and then uh, and then just downshifting as you mentioned is that right mm -hmm. uh, it's just saying okay I'm gonna step back and look at this from a more of a uh, neutral or objective point of view am I correct to mm -hmm. say that um, absolutely I, I think I think before you can get to I'm gonna look at this objectively I, I think the downshift sometimes you need to say to yourself inwardly take a deep breath now what's interesting um, I, uh, you know, I miss my father, but he, he was a, a tad critical. Um, and I think it was my good fortune, you know, not to develop 
anger of my own, my, my good fortune is I, I discovered mentors. And I've had five mentors and they've all passed away and my one living mentor is actually the person who started the entire field of leadership. His name is Warren Bennis. Oh, wow. He's out at USC and uh, he's been a mentor of mine for about six or seven years. Oh, and, uh, and so what happens to me is when I'm reacting, um, I, uh, I think of, I have what I call the Dead Mentors Society. So I can imagine all those mentors, and they weren't just technical mentors, they actually believed in me that, that I had something to offer the world, and it wasn't just anything technical. And uh, so in my mind, one of the things that helps me back off the amygdala is that I can I can picture all those mentors and even Warren saying to me in a loving, caring, firm way, Mark, stop. But it's not like a, a critical dad would say it. Compassionate. It's like it's a compassionate, loving person saying stop, not because they want to be right, because I'm only hurting myself. Mm. And so one of the things that I do when I start escalating is I imagine those people who loved and cared about me, and and I uh, even now as I remember them I could tear up because I I suddenly miss them. I feel grateful. I feel like what good fortune. How did I deserve to have s such wonderful people care about me? And so, just like you got, you softened a little bit, you can probably feel that instead of my, you know, being glib and lecturing, as I think of those people and I imagine them, I imagine their faces. I imagine them smiling down, not just on me, but on you, because you could use a little bit of a transfusion in this area. <laughs> uh, you can have a mentor graft. I'll give you a mentor graft if you need it. But um, um, I'll share something. This is, this is personal, but who cares? Uh, who cares? No one's going to see this in America. But uh, <laughs> well, my uh, some of my students are in America. So <laughs> okay, okay, no, but it's okay. But uh, uh, the last several times I've seen Warren, and Warren Bennis is this loving, calm, charming, wise individual, and he's not just admired and respected; he's beloved. He's beloved. Uh, and the last several times that I saw him, 25% of the time we're having a meal, I'm crying. I'm not sobbing, I'm just with him and, and my eyes are tearing and I'm listening. And he sort of notices, but he doesn't notice. He doesn't know what to say, I'm not talking about it. Um, and he and I have a bit of a kind of, a, we, we can kind of kid each other. And one of, the, one of the things that powerful people don't want is they don't want to be used. They don't want you to hit on them, can you do me a favor? You know, because everyone's hitting on them. And so, uh, so I'm tearing up and I said to him, I said, Warren, uh, I have a confession to make. I think I've been using you oh, for six months. And he immediately went like this and then he smiled at me because he knows I'm going to say something kind of off the wall. And he said, what's this about? And I said, you probably noticed that I cry a little bit of the time when I'm with you. And he said, yeah, I noticed that. I said, well, one of the reasons I'm using you is that when I'm in your presence, I'm healing a relationship with my father who died 18 years ago. And as I feel the healing, I tear up. And it goes back to what I'm saying is, uh, whatever mirror neuron gap that might have existed between my father and me, and again, he did the best he could. Uh, you know, I, I don't hold this against him. I, you know, I don't want to uh, carry grudges. It's a waste of time. But the fact that you know, Warren felt or feels that I'm worthy to spend his most precious resource, which is his time, with me. And there's many more powerful and presidents of countries and businesses that want his time. You know, he's running out of time. And so the fact that he actually uh, would share it with me and, and actually listen to me, feel that what I was saying was deserving of his, of his understanding, it, 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 it healed something. Uh -huh. 
And so, uh, I, I hope some of that gets through to some. It's, what I'm saying got through to you. So I, I'm, uh, I really would like it. I hope it can get through to some of the project managers. I know that might seem very soft, but uh, but something I will tell you because one of the reasons, one of the ways that I got into the business world as a clinical psychiatrist is I did house calls to dying patients and their families. And at the end of their life, I tried to help them make peace with themselves. And a number of these people were high achievers, but loners. They were high achievers. Uh, they sold their company many years before. They'd sacrificed relationships with their children and their wives. And at the end of their life, a number of them felt that they missed it, that they failed at life. And so it was up to me to try to help them um, make peace with that. And, uh, and what would happen is I got into the business world because I was able to somehow resolve conflicts in hours that have been going on for decades. And so when the, sometimes the founder would die, the next generation would say, would you come in to our company you know, and help us cooperate? You did something in hours that we couldn't do in decades. And I said, I'm a psychiatrist. I deal with jealousy. I deal with backstabbing. I deal with envy. Do you have any of that? And they looked at me and they say, that's all we have. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving an assignment to your students and to you. Um, and then you can all email me. or let, Okay, whoever's listening to this, email Esan and tell me what happens. I want you to think of someone in your life who stood up for you when you couldn't stand up for yourself, stood by you in a crisis and wouldn't let you fail, stood up to you to push you to do something that you didn't think you were capable of, or stood up to you and stopped you from doing something stupid and you listened to them because they loved you and believed you. I want you to think of such a person and I want you to find them or they're next of kin, and there's something that I write about in Just Listen, and it's called a power thank you. And I want you to give them or their next of kin a power thank you, and it goes like this. Um, and you'll be a little embarrassed. You could say, you know, because uh, uh, I've interviewed some amazing people, and when we got to this exercise, a number of them get sort of upset, and they said, you know, I don't think I ever thanked that teacher. I don't think I ever thanked that neighbor. And they got upset with themselves. Um, and I want you to find that person or next of kin and say, hi, this is so-and-so, and your dad or your mom was one of my teachers. And I don't think I was special. I think they were special because I think they did this to a lot of people. And a power thank you has three parts. The first thing is what they did. The second thing is the effort it took for them to do it. And the third thing is what it personally meant to you. So the first thing might be, uh, you know, your husband or your dad um, believed in me when I didn't think I would amount to anything. And, 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 and they pushed me. They say, don't you give up on yourself. And, uh, and they saw something in me that I didn't. And the effort they took, they... Uh, they went out of their way. I mean, they were busy and they didn't have to stay after class. They didn't have to care that way, but they did. And what it personally means to me is um, I wouldn't be who I am. I, the, I wouldn't be the best parts of who I am if it wasn't for your mom or your dad. And, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't say this sooner. And um, but I'm saying it now. And I will tell you, if you or your students do that, and you're fortunate enough the person is alive, it will make their day, it will make your day, and what you will realize is that you've had guilt hanging over you without knowing it, that you never thank them. And even if you're an engineer, this will get to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I think I will do that. <laughs> your whole life flashed before your eyes, I can tell. <laughs> anyway, okay. Thank to you be very continued. Much. Thank so you, Mark. I will see you soon. Uh, okay.
You have a great day and thanks again. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.